thank you for coming on coming on this today. I really appreciate this. So I could go through like a whole intro on who you are and what you've done, but I feel like you are better suited for that. So would you mind telling us your background? How did you get into filmmaking? I got into filmmaking when I was young. I think it was when I was maybe like nine or 10 that I first kind of had the dream to make movies. And one of the things that really captured me early on was watching behind the scenes of a movie that I had uh, that I really liked and I was like oh that'd be cool um, and a few things along the way I mean I, I got my start in iMovie with a Mac Book Pro and and then I went um, I did some YouTube stuff you can actually see my original YouTube stuff on uh, on YouTube it gets me. it's under my name Matthew Jordan but um, but yeah it's it's been it's been a crazy journey since then so I had a video business eventually MJ Multimedia and then um, always kind of wanting to make a movie someday and that kind of went to counter column which we'll talk about more but yeah so how long so how long have you been making uh, films and like years wise? Would you say like um, by films you're making just like any sort of video? Yeah, uh, commercials and it doesn't matter. Yeah, since I was twelve. All right, awesome. Yeah, I'm twenty three now, so that would be eleven years. Very good, very very good. All right, so tell us about your movie. Just made your first feature length uh, film, Counter Column. So Counter Column is a film about a team from San Antonio, Texas, who grows up in a hard lifestyle, um, not really having parents in his life and on the streets getting into drug dealing and stuff. And he joins the army out of sort of a necessity to leave town and kind of start fresh and get away from trouble. And um, while he's there, he meets uh, some Midwest Midwest dudes who have very different uh, take on life than he does, and as they their worldviews collide, um, it makes for a lot of, a lot of drama on top of the nine hardest weeks of their life of basic training. So it's set at basic training. A lot of it is, and uh, it's a drama. So it's mostly. Um... So, so it's mostly at basic training. So it's just this entire process of um, like boot camp, basically, is what you're saying. Yeah, a large majority of the film takes place at boot camp. Gotcha. So, um, so Contra Column is a is a faith based film, as I understand it. That is correct. Yes, sir. Awesome. So, um, so the Christian film industry, then, that is a very niche um, part of part of filmmaking. So, uh, can you can you tell me uh, what you think? Um, are the differences uh, between the the faith-based film industry and the secular one? So anything of note that you've noticed? Well, that's a good question, Chris. Um, the The biggest thing is uh, it's important to realize that the film industry at large includes Christians as well. Um, being a talking about a Christian audience, you would say it's it's a subset of the film industry at large. And some of the defining factors uh, are that a lot of a lot of people in the faith film audience, they want content that is, I guess, more wholesome, more um, appropriate for younger kids, and usually along the lines of cleaner content than you would typically see in regular um, blockbuster films and uh, and I think that what's interesting about that is that desire is actually so strong for a lot of people that they don't you know that they'll sacrifice maybe uh, quality for for that and so um, you definitely see a lot of Christian films that come out that are what some might say are subpar and it's not like they're not making money they're actually making money and it's a christian film audience that's paying for it. 
Yeah, I've heard you actually describe it as one of the, um, as, uh, I, I forget exactly how you worded it, like one of the more uh, easy, not easier, but like more, it, it's, despite how small they are, like the vast majority of them are independent films, as, as yours was, I believe. Yeah. Um, so, so, but most of them do make money, be, partially because of their low budget, but also because their niche audience is very, very hungry for um, for what they offer. So, how has um, how would you say your your movie fits into that uh, as a whole? That list of of Christian films that you that you said varied in quality uh, or uh, or audience. Um, how would you say your film fits in that? Well, I think you had a good point when you said it's kind of a combination of a low budget and uh, and kind of the dedicated audience and i think that that's kind of where we land we're not we're not multi-million dollar production and so it's um, something that we're going to be able to pay back easier budget wise than a production that spent 100 million dollars on stuff Um, and you know the the film has a bent towards catering to an audience that wants wholesome clean entertainment um so there's things we avoided putting in there that would have been that that uh that audience so would you say that the uh the movie is for uh both um christians and non-christians in that case yeah it's a for sure all right so both equally i see all right well um, this is your first time doing it. So tell, so tell us a little bit about, um, about how the process is, you know, what is the process of making a feature film from start to finish? You were, you were the producer of it. So how's that been? Um, should I talk about, I guess, the role of a producer? Would that be good to clarify? Uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be good to clarify also. And then just talk about, um, how, what you did basically to, um, to make this thing happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a lot of people think about movie making and they think about cameras and lights and acting um, I would call those more the glamorous jobs Um, there are a lot of jobs behind the scenes with film and those are the jobs that don't get as much attention but they're usually the harder jobs and I think one of those is producing um, essentially what you're doing is taking, bringing all the pieces together to make the film and you have a lot of uh, power but you also don't have a lot of creative control over the final product um, so you have to kind of have a trade-off there but basically I took care of hiring and firing people and basically just hiring but uh, get the idea a lot of people, you know, figuring out who could help us, who, who wouldn't be able to. And uh, that's kind of the, the idea of like what a producer does is just like making it, um, making it happen and just getting out of the way so that the director can take it once you reach the set and also being able to um, being able to take care of any issues that come up, problems that arise. Um, sorry, something's keeping in. I keep playing. <laughs> All right, so so um, you. All right, so that's that's what a producer is in in general, and yeah, you mentioned more a little bit of what you did. Um, what about um, I like uh, I believe you mentioned we were talking on the phone uh, uh last a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Um, you talked about how you guys had a Kickstarter and um, how you told us you you went through a lot of trouble like throughout the entire film process, you know, um, which is very different from a short film, which is what I and a lot of people at Purdue, uh, with me are are in the major are used to. So um. How has it been, like you've done short films, you've done short projects like commercials and whatnot. How has that, uh, how how has it been trying to like manage and maintain something short versus something long? 
It's a lot different. I mean, it really depends on how much money you're spending. You know, when you have a lot of money to spend, it gets harder because you have to learn how to manage the money side of it. Um, I did a lot of projects early on that didn't require money management. And so uh, there's an easier miss to that. I might make a board. Um, and, you know, it's, it's different when you're doing all the work versus having a ton of other people help you. Uh, one of the big things with being a producer was getting other people to do stuff for me, essentially. So, well, for like a short film, you know, I'm filming it. I'm in charge of the story. I'm telling people what to do. We don't even have a script sometimes. And, um, and then I take care of the editing and transferring the footage and all these things. And stepping back into a role of producer and wanting the film to be able to take on life of its own and be bigger than anything I could do myself, I had to surrender a lot of those individual roles. And so it's really uh, producing short film versus producing uh, a feature film. I mean, it's just a whole different load of management and a whole different load of responsibilities, but it also is determined a lot by if you have any money involved or not. So um, let's so let's say that you um, that we had someone who was um, who was about to do their their first feature film and about to produce or direct something uh, have a high, has a high position, you know, and. Um, they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I even begin to do this? What advice would you would you give to that person who's just starting to uh, make longer, uh, bigger projects? I mean, anything you do helps. Uh, the fact that you're making projects helps. And just, uh, just going out there and actually trying to make a short film. And um, for us, you know, after uh, you know, this was the director's first uh, time doing any film making, and this was my first time doing a feature film. And so, you know, there's always going to be firsts, and so you might as well start your first early and sooner rather than later. Matt, come on, you're making your job sound way way easier than it actually is. How's the, um, like, um, I don't know, you, you, um, what would you say was like the hardest part of it? Something that uh, you you can look back on and think, you know what? Wow, I I'm very I'm very happy I went through that. Something specific um, that sticks out in your mind. Um, I I know you I, fought for this, man. Come on, gush with us. So so you have uh, <laughs> you're like something hard and something that you're glad you went through. I think those are two things that are not the same at all. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, everything hard that happened. It's not necessarily like a yay. Because uh, a lot of the hard things that happen while you're producing is it's like stuff that uh, you have to fix. And um, a lot of it for us was fixing mistakes that we had made and fixing things we hadn't planned. And, you know, this is just like, I think my job as producer uh, was a lot harder because we we're doing it for the first time. And so we made a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, some of the hardest, the hardest moments of the whole production were we had a, a whole two weeks where we hadn't really locked any locations. Um, so we're trying to figure out the locations as we go through the weeks basically. And um, that was probably the most stressful season of my life. Um, hardly sleeping at all. and constantly fixing problems and figuring things out and um you know if all i had to do is figure out locations that'd be fine but since i had to do so many other things to keep the ball rolling you know people are filming as i'm trying to figure out what's next um it's definitely a lot to do and and then uh for this film in particular we had a shortage of basic training recruit extras and so uh, myself, along with several other crew members, uh, shaved our heads and beards and <laughs> were extras in the film. And, and that was probably, uh, that probably took stress uh, up level for me because, you know, I'm 
having to answer phone calls and make phone calls in between in between shots and uh it was just a whole whole other level of, of stress for sure i imagine you had to really really trust you you said before that you had to delegate a lot of the positions like uh uh, to other people because you have to you just have to do that for organizational sake how has it been to like have to trust someone else with things that you're used to having control over it's not easy it's definitely not easy um it yeah it took a lot of uh it takes a lot of i guess it's a very humbling thing to just say okay i'm gonna not worry about this and it's all in your hands and um for me that i think the trusting other people um as as a christian it kind of goes in hand with trusting god um i kind of trust him with my life and and everything going on and i'm very much okay with what happens even if i am uh not a fan in the moment and you know it's this it's a similar thing where i just turn things over and say you know what it's not not in my hands anymore it's all i'm entrusting it to to the director's vision i'm trusting it to the dp's vision i'm entrusting it to the production designer's vision um and so there has to be this kind of this letting go i guess and uh i think it was definitely uh god giving me a lot of grace to be able to do that um and also just a lot of grace to be able to see the vision uh, of, you know, there's, there's kind of these two visions. One vision is very distinct and that's like the creative vision. Um, and there's another vision that comes along when you're in the management producing and that vision is to see it finished. And so it's these two visions actually, it's, it's hard to, uh, to actually hold on to both of them. And so, my job was to, you know, let go of the creative vision and embrace the vision of, of seeing everyone work together and the vision of seeing it. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of bigger problems to worry about than the look of the shot. And, um, you know, for example, you know, people getting along on set and contracts being fulfilled, and people getting paid and, you know, figuring out budget. It's just a whole, whole different set of things. But it all falls into this vision of like finishing and actually completing something that uh, you know you wouldn't they aren't going to be able to complete it without you and you're not going to be able to complete it without them so it's a lot of mutual trust in, in all honesty because um i know the director he had to surrender his you know any any sort of say in in contracts and negotiations and locations and eventually you know a lot of you know a lot of power of you know but but for him it was i think it was easier because he didn't have to worry about it all and it was stuff he didn't necessarily want to worry about so gotcha all right so um is there anything that you would uh you you had a process that you that you went through to make this happen you had a kickstarter you went um you rely you relied on volunteers to to a fairly large degree um would you do the is are you going to do basically the same thing uh from now from now on or are you going to change your strategy so uh we used a lot of volunteers a lot of people volunteered to work on film and largely because of a lack of resources and it was kind of out of necessity. And uh, I think, in all honesty, if we can if we can afford to pay people for an film, we'll pay people. And uh, we really want to, you know, it, not just ask people to do stuff for free for us. Um, though we're so, so thankful that they did. And, you know, even well, so many people still are doing things for free for this project um, you know all in all it's a donor based project everyone all the money we have has just been given to us so you know we just give it out to people to help us finish the film but early on especially we couldn't pay most of our crew and uh 
but it was really neat at the same time because everybody who was there was there for the same reason and they were there for the right reasons we felt it wasn't they weren't just compulse and they weren't doing it out of compulsion because they were getting paid it was like more than just a job to them it was a vision that they were hope, helping complete and so in a lot of ways you know counter column was a very unique set very special and um you know, we really would love to pay everybody uh, the next time around. Um, but we also realize, you know, it's not going to be the same in some ways because, you know, everyone's there for a job essentially. But, um, but, but we definitely see the value in paying people and would prefer to do it that way if God provides the resources. Gotcha. All right. Um, so you mentioned before, you mentioned several times now that you've, that you've relied on a lot of volunteers. That's actually very similar to what, um, to what a lot of people just in general do, you know, when they're early on, when they're just making short films, they just, and they can't pay people, they literally can't. They, so they have to um, re rely on their friends or, or connections that they have. Yeah. Um, what advice would you uh, give to someone who wants to make something, um, but just does not have the connections? Maybe I could offer a little bit of advice or, you know, if you're working with volunteers, period, I would say, um, make sure you feed them. Uh, that's one of the big rules. Is make sure that they, they never are hungry on set. Make sure you have snacks available. Uh, if they're working for free, you need to respect them. Never treat them like uh, they're not fellow workers on set. Like, you know, it's a it's a sacrifice that they're making for you and that's something that should be appreciated and and thanked as much as possible um if they're if they're coming from out of town definitely like make a way for them to get lodging um don't work longer than you have to um you know if at all possible you know if someone's volunteering for you it's it's good to try to have have shorter days if you can um just being aware of their own their schedule and working around their schedule as much as possible um and then also you know we tried to pay everybody gas money you know people were going to turn us receipts turn us in receipts um for their gas expenses throughout the film and that was something we did for our, our volunteers so they didn't have to pay to get from one place to another and we covered their food and lodging and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, overall it was people who are paid to be on film sets. You typically do the same thing for them. Um, so that's not uncommon. Um, and as far as uh, if you don't have the connections, um, I think that it's very important to connect with those that you know and you know there's a lot of people that that are around you that you have no idea how they could benefit necessarily a short film or a film but you'd be surprised like it's part of filmmaking is being creative with your resources and, and in a lot of ways you know your friends are a resource who you know is a resource where you're at is a resource getting to know everybody um you know, the biggest thing is like saying hi to people like just like say trying to be friendly and um you know having short little conversations with everybody you run into like it goes it goes so far because you never know when you'll need someone who looks like them as an actor or when you'll need a voice that sounds like this person or when you'll need uh access to <coughs> the store that store or whatever and uh wherever and a large reason we were able to uh, film everywhere um, we did was because of just local connections we had and a lot of support came through our church church and other churches that were people who worked locally on the film so uh, definitely uh, don't don't be discouraged if you don't have connections, but I would say just realize that you do have connections uh, without realizing it, you know, 
think we think of connections as like people that could get us somewhere. <laughs> but if you take the mentality of a producer, um, the people around you are people you could take somewhere. Um, so think of yourself, you know, as, as a resource, you know, you're, you can get stuff together. You can bring some collaboration together and, and uh, see what happens. Gotcha. Would you say that you do, uh, that you personally um, knew or talked with uh, everyone who showed up on set at some point? Um, I would not say that for um, people who are extras or background talent. I wasn't able to personally talk with a lot of them. Um, but anyone who was in, on crew, anyone who acted um, as an actor was speaking role. Um, I think I did have a chance to talk to all, all of those people. Gotcha. All right. So um, you said for you said back uh, that you that you've done commercials. You have a com a company that does that called MJ Multimedia, where you do. I believe you did weddings uh, before and things like that. What? Um, how do you know when you're ready to make a feature length film? I would say. <laughs> you get a lot of different responses to that question. I would say you're never ready. It's like a lot of things in life, you just gotta go for it. Um, if you've never made any sort of video, you definitely wanna make a short film first. Uh, that teaches you a lot. And if you can do that as much like a feature film as possible, um, that'll teach you a lot. I did a project called Barton Band when, um, I don't know how many years it was. It was before we even started working on the script for Count and Tom, I think. It was a short film, and I, for the first time, actually produced. I actually got, like, a ton of people together to do it and, and a bunch of different positions, and I researched all the film positions. And, you know, a lot of what I did on that short film laid the groundwork for what I did for Count and Tom with getting all the positions filled and having a, a little understanding of, how is that supposed to run? Um, what's really cool about producing is, you know, once you're on that level, if you have money, um, you can pay anybody to do anything. Like it's um, <laughs> the, the big deal is like you can get professionals to come help you, and all of a sudden your your little feature film idea turns into a pretty big deal, um, just with the right financing and stuff. Um, for us, like, I was just so thankful that a lot of the people who came had more experience than we did. And our film set, even though I had never had, never done a film before, feature film, um, it ran like a real feature film set. And for some people, um, they had never been on a feature film set in their life. And this was their first experience on a feature film, which is crazy to think about. Um, I didn't, that was just hard for me to comprehend because I was like, well, this is my first feature film. Like, <laughs> it's not a legit film set, but um, for a lot of people, it was, and it was. It was like you go on set, pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Kind of. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, just do, do during like early on, get in the habits of what will uh, of what feature film. Uh, sets are like to uh, to prepare for that. That's a very, that's a very yeah. good thought. You can work on a feature film in turn. Um, <clears throat> that's always phenomenal. Um, Speaking of that, actually, um, so yeah, like so yeah, you um, so you, so you're ahead of uh, of a lot of a lot of us uh, ahead of a lot of um, a lot of people. You know, people including myself. I I consider making a feature film of any kind, regardless of how it did financially to be a milestone. So I have a question for you. At, at the level that you are at, um, how do you think about your career? Like for me right now, for example, I'm in college. I have, I've only made a few short films. I may be thinking about trying to get an internship. I may be thinking about, okay, how do I make the picture look good or whatever else? What do you think about? I don't know if anybody, you know, it's everybody's the same in a lot of ways. I, I've thought about interning myself with producers that know more than me. Like, 
there's always stuff to learn. There's always ways to get better. Um, I think a lot of me just wants to make another film. That's kind of, you know, what I love doing. And uh, so, you know, career-wise, what what we're looking at is we have a finished film, but we need to get it out there somehow. So we don't we don't have a distributor yet. We don't have things in place to to get it out. But um, so that's a huge task. And so in a lot of ways, you know, I'm still producing my first feature film. It's not done yet. Um, and you know, it's it's a it's a never-ending job in a lot of ways. Um, you uh, you know, having a a feature film under your belt, so to speak, is a lot more complicated than it sounds because you know you're still trying to um, sell it and you're still trying to make money and you know it's it's an interesting journey for sure. Um, we've got a the filming under our belts, so to speak, you know, and most of post-production under our belts, but not necessarily, it's not out for the public yet. So that's a big part of it as well. It's absolutely quite a journey, um, especially when you manage to get your, your movie featured on what is basically the Sundance of, um, of Christian film, uh, which is the Christian Worldview Film Festival. So, my next question to you is, how do people um, see you? Uh, like, how, how do fellow filmmakers look at you now, now that you've done, now that you've made a feature film that got into that? Um, how is that, how do people see you now? Uh, you'd have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> how do you think they see you? <laughs> how do you hope they see no, you, maybe? No, <laughs> no I, I, think, I think an honest <laughs> answer to that question, um, is that you know once you've made a feature film you definitely uh, it definitely opens up a lot more doors so when people know that you finished a feature film and especially when counter column comes out um, when i talk to someone they're gonna actually um, if if i'm trying to maybe get an investor interested in the project you know they'll be a lot more quick to invest because we've actually done a feature film you know or if i uh, approach someone about, you know, hey, can you, I'm making another film, you want to act in it, or, you know, you just, when you've made a feature film, it gives away to what you're doing in the future. It's kind of like a, a really great portfolio uh, piece, if you would, um, but it's a pretty rocking portfolio piece, um, and especially if it does well, then if people like it, but, you know, how people see me, um, I hope they see me as Matthew Jordan. <laughs> Not necessarily as kind of calm producer. Interesting thought. Okay, um, so now that you have stepped through this uh, this big uh, threshold and uh, people do probably see you differently, you know, you have more uh, opportunities because of it. Are you, are you going to uh, go back to, like do you even consider it going back uh, to um, making short films, commercials, wedding videos. Are you going to return to that at all? Or are you just leaving that behind? I'm only doing uh, film, uh, feature films now. Um, so short films for me have never been paid. Hmm. And so I could definitely see myself doing short films. So we actually did a 48 hour film thing just like a month or two ago. Um, so that's something that we do uh, still. On I see so much value in doing short films because, you know, there's even like one of our actors we used in the film, uh, Calvin Holm, came from me doing a short film with them earlier. And it was just somebody I thought would be good as a part in this short film. And they ended up, we ended up liking them enough where it was like, oh, they should come act in our feature film. And so in a lot of ways, you know, just doing short films or that it's kind of that space to test your creative wings and um, try new things. And it's a lot less pressure than a feature film and a lot easier to knock it out fast. And you could do it all in a day and just different things like that that make it really, really good. It's, it's really, it's like kind of like working out your filmmaking muscles is doing short films. And, and so I, I actually want to do more short films for those reasons, 
and just, you know, to connect with people, get more people involved, you know, and, and learning, you know, you're always learning to how to deal with situations and manage people and all these good things. Um, as for commercials and things like that, that's kind of how I make, uh, you know, money. And so I'll still do, be doing some video projects to make some, some money. And, uh, but I'm trying to move towards uh, doing more online advertising as far as my actual business and do multimedia. But, you know, as, as filmmaking kind of continues, Lord willing, with, uh, with Countercom coming out, and maybe another project in the works, then, you know, who knows, maybe I'll go full time into that. But as yet to be determined, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting that um, it's it really is all relative. When I, uh, a lot of people at college level, like uh, at Purdue, um, like we we do short films like pretty much exclusively. Um, a lot of people end up doing a what's called a capstone, which is a um, a forty minute uh, in length uh, video, and um, that seems like yeah. oh my god, that's crazy. But to you, it now it seems more like practice than uh, than anything else. I just think that's very interesting. So, um, capstone would stink. I wouldn't do a capstone video. That's like, <laughs> really, why is that? I would do for myself, like 40 minutes seems like a waste to me. I would do something like five to 10 minutes max and then feature film. But anything in between, the reason it seems like a waste to me is because, you know, a short film that's five to 10 minutes you can knock out in a day. Um, while anything longer than that would kind of take more time. And uh, and a short film to me is not a profit maker. And so I'm doing it for fun. I'm doing it to, to gain experience. A feature film has the potential to make money. Anything that's kind of less than that 100 minute range, it's harder to sell. So you can't really make it for profit necessarily. Um, unless you're going to like submit to festivals and even even festivals you know short films for festivals typically range between five to 15 minutes um and so for you guys for your purpose learning you know essentially you're making a capstone video as kind of like the movie of your uh of your degree or whatever which is good it's just like at my point where am i i'm at i would if any, if I'm doing anything for fun, it's gonna be probably only like a day worth of filming and um, something that children in length, because it's so much more manageable. The longer you go, the harder it is to film it. And so 40 minutes is still really hard to do. Um, it's not easy. And you know, 60 minutes, you know, our film is 100, I think 106 minutes, 103 minutes. It's hard, it's really hard to do. Um, to make it engaging, it to make an engaging film, it takes so much work. The longer it is, that's why some you know short films can be in your face, engaging, and it's easier to make it engaging when it's in that three to five minute range. You're condensing everything, and so yeah, just random thoughts. In that case, I have a I have an additional question for you on that. So um, as you and I both know, I mean you can. It, it, yeah, you, a feature length film obviously takes a long, a longer time than a than a shorter one. Forty minutes obviously is harder to do probably than um, than a than a five minute one. But yeah. we also both know that even five minutes can be an, a serious challenge depending on what you're doing. So, mm -hmm. what my question to you then would be: Okay, uh, if I'm not going to, if I'm trying to like do something that I've never done before, this big project that I've never done before, um, instead of doing that forty minute thing, what do you think it should be? Well, I think that the 40 minute thing is, is, I think that that's perfectly acceptable for what you guys are trying to do with your degree and stuff. You know, it's what they're trying to do is they're trying to give you kind of more of the feature film experience on a smaller scale. Um, so that's essentially all it is, um, which is good. And uh, you'll, the, it's, you know, it's it's like challenge. It's like a challenge to make. It's a challenge to make ten minute engaging short film. It's going to be a bigger challenge for you guys to make a forty minute, what I call short film. But yeah, so like capstone, whatever. 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's literally called a short film. Anything that's that is less than feature length, I think is considered a yeah. short film, isn't it? Yeah. 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 All right. Very interesting. Very we've definitely not heard that heard that perspective because uh we're I mean we're not we're not required to do so. Uh it is it is purely an option. It's just interesting that um uh, to hear a different perspective on it. So thank you. Well, if it's an option, then that's that's another thing, you know. It's, so would you so you're still you're still like against the idea like as a whole though like you would rather do something if you're going to just improve yourself you would rather do a shorter project. For myself, what I would do is I'd choose to do something shorter hmm. because I feel like I could succeed at it easier. Gotcha. Very cool. All right. Um, is there anything that you would like to change about the film industry if you could? So film, film is very powerful. Media is very powerful. Um, this actually goes into music as well. Um, music and, and movies are both kind of these key elements of our culture right now that definitely influence the way that a lot of people think and feel about different issues and topics. And I think, you know, it's, it's the right of the filmmaker to be political in their films and or the musician to be political in their in their in their music or whatever, and um, you know, expressing opinion is one thing. But then, but then when you're going to, uh, I think I think one thing that needs to be cracked down actually on is like just the way that things are expressed, uh, things that would be illegal to do in the United States. You know, the way that's expressed in film and the way that's expressed in music. I think that there just needs to be a little bit more caution um, and, and possibly even regulation. And, you know, so for example, um, in music, you know, the, the, sell, the sale of illegal drugs is talked about and all this stuff. And, and I know some, somebody who sold drugs illegally said they, they found out about it and all they they learned it all from from the you know from like hip hop songs and stuff and um, it's like uh, you know we're not necessarily helping people um, stay out of trouble with the law by pumping some some of this stuff through the media to them and so <laughs> the same type of thing goes with you know with movies and also with video games and you know. The rating system is there for a reason you know a lot of times it's up to parents to use discretion to what their kids can and cannot listen to and watch and play but that's just a or just kind of a side thought to ponder is like you know there's um it's kind of like whatever we portray as good in movies um i think the culture of america as a whole tends to accept that think that that's good as well and so there's a lot of power there and uh, I think we we as filmmakers coming at it from a filmmaking perspective we as filmmakers need to be careful that we don't uh, don't portray things that we think are wrong it's good and vice versa gotcha I see all right thank you um, all right final question for you thank you for all for all of your thoughts um, before we head into Q and A, mm -hmm. um, is there um, is there anything that we have not talked about? Um, some final words or final advice that you have for people that we haven't mentioned, gone over. Well, I guess I'd just like to encourage people. Like I, I uh, just got into it. You know, I was I was homeschooled through high school, and uh, had a lot of time because of that to get into video. But for me, doing movies was, you know, it was always a, it was a dream, but it was, uh, I didn't realize how, how, how fast it could happen, I guess. And so, you know, making Gamacom was a huge, huge blessing, but also just a real shock in a lot of ways. Like, wow, I'm actually making a feature film. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's not, it's not far off, you know doing something like that and um, a lot of times these people that are huge professionals that are you know what if 
even like Christopher Nolan, you know, like he started somewhere and he was a nobody at one time. And, uh, you know, it, it, you know, say 20 years ago, some of these people were just in the same place you guys are and the same place I'm at, um, where it's like, you know, we're all kind of in this trend to make movies. And so, so it's good to like, definitely like, be encouraged that like anything's possible and um for myself being a christian it's it's really like with god all things are possible and you know my life is given to him and so you know everything's like you know i say god you know if you want me to make a movie then you open that door and so that's what i attribute counter film to it's just uh kind of walking in obedience to god and where i feel he's called me to go and do and um but you know he brings connections into our life for a reason and so as i was saying before you know the people around you are so important and you don't realize how important they'll be in your future um so just you know just the small conversations you know being friendly and all that just goes so far down the road and it's good to be a networker good to um, be encouraging to people and uh, really be more about them than about yourself. And uh, when they feel like you really care about them, then, you know, they're so much more willing to come and help you out on a project. So. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, with that, I am done with my questions. Um, Adi, with our, uh, we are, so we can move on to Q&A. So please type your questions into the chat if you have any for uh, directed toward Matthew right now. Ooh, that is a good question from Jaden. Uh, his, his question is before, uh, uh, how have you stayed professionally active during the quarantine? So we were actually about to release Countercomb publicly um, and just kind of go down this road of possibly self-distribution. We had a premiere lined up for April 23rd or something, um, essentially next week. And we had a whole series of local screenings scheduled. And so it's all canceled and we had more time to wonder what to do. We actually went back and uh, started making some cuts to the film, which I don't recommend after you've had a composer and sound designer work on the film. <laughs> um, we did this because a potential distributor we talked to had some suggestions for us. And so we actually did cut a lot. Um, and so this is kind of the professional, <laughs> professionally active, you know, we're just, we're just like you guys are just working on, on making things better. And, uh, there's a lot of repercussions when you make big edits like that. And so having to have our sound designer re-edit some things and I'm having to work with her to get the right things. And, um, then we have our composer fixing a few tracks that we messed up because we cut in the middle of the track or whatever, you know. Um, so I've tried to just, you know, we're, we're keeping busy making the film better, essentially. Good, good question. Good. Awesome. Yeah, I can't believe I didn't think of that. Like, seriously, kid, come on. Yeah, we're in know. quarantine. You're under lockdown, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. What's going on? Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm out and about a little bit more than I should be, probably. Yeah. All right. Well, that is about it from me. I have no further questions. Uh, Jaden, if you have um, if you have other questions, please um, please type them in. Otherwise, you can reach Matthew on Facebook uh, and support his movie Countercom. You can still do that. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming on.